Welcome to another episode of Feed My Sheep, Earthquake Reports, and more. I'm Terry Rempel. It's the 28th. Good morning. And we've got a bunch of information for you. And this is an in-depth look at uh, subduction in central in Southern California. And this is a what? What do you mean subduction in central and Southern California? It's not supposed to happen according to the earth, uh, to the experts. And we're going to be looking north and look at extensions, uh, potential extensions of the Cascadia subduction zone to the north as well. And the activity that's been up there and uh, why we're looking at this as a much bigger um, Cascadia earthquake, mega thrust earthquake when it occurs. And, uh, and also look at the reasons for precursor earthquakes in California that uh, we expect are coming up in the, in the relatively new, near future, but we, we can't say that, that can be within a period of the next couple of years and we, uh, we can't pinpoint um, large earthquakes and we're not aware of anybody that, uh, that can with any, any regularity. I tried once and, and failed. Before we begin all of this, um, all of our programs are dedicated to our Heavenly Father service, and uh, we'll have a prayer first. Please join me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of the understandings that were granted. We thank you for the uh, protection of this program, that it's that you uh, draw people here to, to see this, and uh, we thank you for that. This is uh, your platform, your program, not ours, and we... Uh, we give you all the glory for it. Jesus, we thank you for the understandings that we're led to, and there's a great many uh, deeper understandings that we receive, and we appreciate those. And we're very glad to serve and, and share those with, uh, with all who are here to watch. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for the understanding of all of these things that you bring, that you add to all of this. And we seek to serve well as uh, darkness grows across across the world with uh, intents of evil um, being made more and more clear uh, in so many areas. We thank you for the light that you provide in this darkness. And we pray that it draws a great many to salvation after your um, great sacrifice on the cross, Jesus and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Subduction in Central and Southern California. So according to the textbooks and the experts, subduction is not supposed to occur south of the Mendocino Ridge, which points eastward at the Mount Lassen Lake Almanor area. Lake Almanor is at the very south end of the Cascadia subduction zone, and uh, on May 11th, Lake Almanor, which is a volcanic location, had two earthquakes over magnitude 5.0 within eight hours. And this fulfilled the uh, first early stage warning of the Great Cascadia earthquake that I set in place about three years ago. But this, is part, this was part of the progression of changes in California that we have been exposing for over three years. Now, since that... Uh, that pair of earthquakes, uh, 5.0 and greater. I believe the uh, the largest was a 5.7 and the next one down was a 5.5. We've since had a 4.5 and a number of smaller. Two days ago, we um, had a 2. Point, uh, or three days ago, a 2.5 in, in the area or reported as a 2.5. So the earthquakes continue larger at Lake Almanor than, uh, than pretty much any of the... Uh, Cascadia Range volcanoes. It's the most active site for earthquakes uh, that we're aware of at this point. Um, Mount St. Helens may be uh, a close contender. Um, it's got uh, a lot of activity and it's having some larger, larger activity as well, um, larger than what's being reported. Uh, so there's, there's a lot going on in the Cascade Range and that's part of what we're looking at with California. So first we'll look at uh, milestone precursor events. And so precursor to what? Precursor to the Cascadia megathrust earthquakes. Uh, what have we had so far? And in this category, I placed the 2019 Ridgecrest earthquakes. And why the Ridgecrest earthquakes? Um, the sizes, first of all, of the largest recorded uh, were a 5.4, a 6.4, and a 7.1. But the largest earthquake was initially reported as a 7.5. And with damage, uh, 
I, ha I had the incorrect number um, last report. The early reports had the largest of these at a 7.5, and the total damage estimates come in at 5.5 billion. I think I had 5.3 billion, but anyway, pretty close. Um, so this was very, very likely a magnitude 7.8, larger than what they were saying. And there was certainly a tremendous number of aftershocks after that largest earthquake in Ridge, Ridgecrest. Um, so there was there was major episodes. If the seven point if the seven point one was a seven point eight, it's very likely that the six point four was more in the seven point one range. Um, probably kept the same spread. Or so let's see, if we're seven point eight and we drop uh, seven points. Then we're 7.1. So probably the 6.4 would be a 7.1, a step down very much like that. So large, large activity. Now, what points at this being a subduction related earthquake um, and a precursor to the Cascadia mega thrust is that this earthquake caused a major shift of the previously unknown Garlock fault and that shift caused it to be discovered. Now this fault runs perpendicular to the main fault trans in California, which are south southeast to north northwest. California faults are well studied, but the Garlock fault was unknown because it had not not shifted for a very long time. And this is not a small fault, that was a very large fault. Um, runs hundreds of miles. So that question the question that should have followed was why did a previously unknown perpendicular fault shift as part of the Ridgecrest earthquake series. Why did it shift? Why did this perpendicular fault shift? Well, you have to change the application of force. Force is applied in the direction of the faults causing um, when they're slip strike. When they're slip strike faults and, and the uh, Ridgecrest earthquake, the Garlock was slip strike, um, you apply um, force that matches the direction of the fault and it's uneven force. So it's um, north, one side of the fault has more pressure than the other side of the fault. And as a result, then it shifts. Well, the force has to be in much the same direction as the fault, a, a tangent, a near tangent of the direction of the fault for to cause that fault to shift in the first place. Um, so applied crustal force had to be much higher on one side of the Garlock fault during the earthquake to cause it to shift. That means that the force had to be perpendicular to the main fault trend, just as the Garlock is perpendicular to the main fault trend. And the only scientifically established cause of this direction of force application is continental drift. And continental drift is proven by the process of geo, geodesy, the scientific process, um, where they use GPS stations and measure the movement of those stations. So these stations are all around the Pacific Ring of Fire. Um, the continental drift causes the Ring of Fire to exist all around the Pacific Ocean. And this is because all the continents around the Pacific Ocean are moving into it. The Pacific Ocean is shrinking. So this is proven by first geodesy, which we've explained, but also the mid-Atlantic ridge spreading, uh, 5 to 10 centimeters a year. And this has been going on ever since the beginning of the mid-Atlantic ridge because it's that magma freezes the pole position in place when it stops moving, when it uh, cools. And this creates magnetic striping of the Atlantic seafloor. So the whole mag Atlantic seafloor has magnetic striping from... Um, lava being frozen in position which locks in the position of the poles at the time when the magma came up. So continental drift is absolutely established. Um, the Atlantic is getting larger, the Pacific is getting smaller, it's the continents all around the Pacific that are moving and that's the process of subduction that we're seeing. So the continental drift is behind the only known factor behind proven scientific factor uh, causation of why the Garlock Fault would have shifted during the Ridgecrest earthquake. So this talks about continental drift forces overcoming other forces and becoming more dominant. So the continental drift direction is established as being west-southwest and the Garlock Fault direction matches the direction of the continental drift pretty closely. Um, 
So what has happened since then is we've seen a massive increase of magma channel development in Southern California. Um, faults provide weak points, and if you're having subduction um, occur, it's not immediately um, felt. It's not immediately seen on seismograms. You can have small incremental changes, and it's not notable enough that people are aware of it. Um, when the tremors get larger along the coast, as they have now, um, it becomes much more obvious, but it's subtle to start with. But you're the uh, the crust that's being fed in subduction is uh, seven to eight miles thick, the oceanic crust. Uh, so you only have to move it a couple of centimeters to, to move a tremendous amount of new material under the volcanoes, uh, down where it's melted out, and uh, then you get reactivation of, of uh, activity. So in the past, California has been tremendously active volcanically. That's why you have the Sierra Nevadas, um, they're all a volcanic range. They're a tremendous volcanic range. And there's uh, many, many other uh, volcanic um, expulsions, buttes, and um, small volcanoes um, closer to the coast um, and, uh, along, the, uh, along California's coastal uh, area. There's, there's just a tremendous amount of um, faulting through California. And we see this with so many volcanic fields and, um, and volcanoes and such. You look at uh, Sutter Buttes and uh, Clear Lake Volcano and Geysers area. Uh, you come down south to um, Mount Diablo, a small volcano there. And uh, south, we've got all kinds of volcanic formations uh, that are east of Fremont. And these continue um, down. And, and so there's no reason to think that they're going to stop and not affect Southern California. But what we've seen in Southern California is a great development of magma channels as opposed to uh, the volcanoes being more active. We're seeing it more in, the, in uh, magma channels which develop inside faults because faults create a crack that goes all the way down to the magma that the crust sits on. So the faults go all the way down and they pro provide the weak point for that pressure of increased, more volatile magma that's created by subduction to rise through the faults. 2019 began the period of significant changes in seismology and activation of magma channels in Southern California. So we look at the State Street site we looked at this on the previous program, but this is incredibly active, and we watched this develop from nearly nothing um, in 2019 to this. And light hype, much the same. And uh, this used to be super busy um, for the State Street site. Now this, this site is actually busier than what State Street uh, used to be. It just keeps uh, building and building. And we've watched these sites um, develop over the course of the last four years. So there are many developing threats, and we covered these in the other program, which are associated with these magma channels. Now, the next milestone precursor to the Cascadia was the magnitude 7. We assessed it as a 7. Um, the series earthquake south-southwest of Ferndale on the 20th of December in 2022. And this was, again, another perpendicular fault. I mean, it's the Mendocino Ridge. Um, of course, it's perpendicular. Perpendicular to the main fault trend. And that one um, started episodic uh, move. Well, it um, provided an, an episode of uh, earthquakes. There was quite a cluster there um, that continued for uh, well over a month. And uh, continues to have a lot of heavy tremor activity um, in the areas around Petrolia. So this, this is continuing activity, but it's not just continued, it's spread and expanded down the coast, and most recently all the way to San Diego. So the increasing levels of shoreline and near shoreline tremors are um, showing the degree of onset or increase of subduction. And... Um, we're seeing increased volcanic type seismic activity at multiple coastal old volcanic mountainous sites. 
And we're seeing increased levels of volcanic activity in the Sierra Nevadas. We're seeing increased tremor activity spreading south all along the western Sierra Nevadas in the foothill areas. And we're seeing increasing activity between Oxnard and San Bernardino, another probable transverse or perpendicular fault. And we're seeing increasing activity south of Salton Sea. Um, and that's very significantly increasing. So there's two precursor events. And, and when you look at the changes that have followed each of the events, you can tell that they're precursors. Um, we saw the development of all the magma channels, um, just, just a massive increase over the last four years since the Ferndale earthquake, or I mean, since the Ridgecrest earthquake. And now after the uh, Ferndale earthquake, we've seen the spread of tremors all down the coast and reactivation of a whole bunch of volcanic centers, including through um, through the uh, Sierra Nevadas and, uh, and others. So and we've covered these on uh, many previous programs. Now, the third precursor event were the two earthquakes over magnitude 5 at Lake Almanor within um, eight hours of each other. And that was on May 11th. So magnitude 5 and greater earthquakes are pretty rare in the Cascade Range. And having two magnitude 5 or greater earthquakes in the Cascade Range within a week is considered quite rare. Um, so Lake Almanor is the very south end of the Cascade Range. It's the transition zone between the Cascade Range and the uh, Sierra Nevada Range. And since these earthquakes, we have observed further increases in activity in central and southern California. So these all go together. If the shoreline tremors are increasing, you're going to get an increase of volcanic activity as more crust is fed underneath the volcanoes. And you get a vertical rise of this lighter, more volatile magma that's created by the process of subduction, by melting the crust that's um, that's down underneath the volcanoes, that's moving down underneath that. So it's, you're seeing one, you don't have one without the other. If you have shoreline tremors and you don't have any volcanic activity increase, then it's not subduction. But we've got shoreline tremors and we've got an increase in volcanic activity and one proves the other. Um, you can't get either one without uh, both of them functioning together. So these changes in Southern California coincide with increases in activity all along the Cascade Range. And there's also been a spread north, and we have to include major reactivation that now extends all the way to Edgecombe Volcano on the west coast of mid, the mid-panhandle hand, of southeast Alaska. And we're going to cover more of this right at the end of the program. And this has followed the last last week's 8.2 near Shishaldan and the eruption blast of Shishaldan to 40,000 feet feet a few days before that. So here's um, the major Edgecombe reactivation signal that we've seen. This is the largest one, and it's showing major infill and subsequent massive uplift fracturing. So the infill begins in here. You can see it's very heavy through here, but this fracturing, this will be uplift fracturing. This did not show at any other um, Alaska volcano sites. This just showed at Edgecombe. So this is localized activity. And Edgecombe is right on the shoreline, midway up the panhandle. And the reason for it to be there would have to be a plate window where there's a fracture of the oceanic plate coming across inland underneath that volcano and feeding um, magma up to it. Um, this is, like I say, this is right on the west coast of not, not just the mainland, but an island off the west coast. So on the west coast of, uh, of an Alaskan island. So that's a lot of activity. And we'll look later, we'll see that this um, was downsized later on. The agencies downsized the activity. Um, so here it is, downsized by at least 50%. So that same activity that we saw that was red all the way through here and larger, um, and there was no space between these lines. They were right on top of each other except for tiny little gaps, got smaller. And this is what we're seeing happen, that they're downsizing the activity, trying to hide what's going on. It's the only logical reason when they do it over and over and over. And we, we'll show you another example of this later on with the same site. So in my observation, this is unprecedented and major reactiv 
reactivation activity at Edgecombe Volcano and points to subduction spreading north from Warnowski Island Volcano, which is uh, the uh, Wrangell site location. It's a volcanic island there that's uh, about six and six and a half miles in diameter. So it's a good sized um, volcanic island. So we have uh, subduction activity spreading both north and south of the traditional expert located Cascadia subduction zone. Now tracking shoreline tremor expansion is so ex is uh, is important in tracking the spread of subduction. So this is a variant of the slow slip tremors that tracking process that was once used in the Pacific Northwest. Now it wasn't used properly, but it was used. And so uh, from the agency's uh, PNS and they said that uh, they were tracking slip of the continent across the oceanic plate and that was causing the slow slip tremors and these were near shoreline tremors and that's what they were and, and somewhat inland and uh, so they would track these and present uh, tremor storms in, in different areas. Well that's happening all through California now. It's the same type, same um, outcome. We're seeing the same type of signals in the Cascadia or in, in uh, Southern California and Northern California Central as we were seeing in the Pacific Northwest. Same tremors along the coastline and there's no faults associated with most of these that are known faults other than the contact zone between the continental plate and the Pacific plates. And so before we look at the more dramatic activity in Southern California, we'll look at the spread of coastal and near coastal sites. So I, I presented these programs backwards. I did the, the greater threats yesterday. And so in this case, we're doing the, uh, the science behind the threats. Um, why? The why of subduction in Southern California. So these are the sites that show evidence of the spread and advances of subduction in central and southern california by the coastal sites having so many more tremors now we begin at rockport we're about 50 miles south of the mendocino and that these these sites will not blow up large so i'm just going to leave them as they are um, so that's major tremors on two different days at rockport that's uh, back on the uh, 25th and 26th. And this is 25th and 26th, Fort Bragg showing tremors on, on both sides of that, both days. And Fort Bragg is right on the coast. Marconi is uh, on the coast near Point Reyes. And it had a, a little larger, um, small earthquake series um, as part of this tremor series. You can see some of the same up there. So we're moving down the coast, showing you the major sites. There's other smaller sites that don't produce these signals as well because the um, seismograms are turned down and or poorly positioned, but um, these are the ones that report well. And there's enough of them to give you the, the information that you need. We're now south of Pacifica on the west coast, south of San Fran. So this is not on the San Andreas. This is uh, west of the San Andreas, right on the coast. Lots of tremors there. Two days. Half Moon Bay has tremors for showing for two days as well. That's south, right on the coast. And now we're at the town of Freedom at North Monterey Bay. And we see um, tremors. This is the, the nightly break that we see on so many of these seismograms, they slow down at night and they pick up in the morning. Um, now this is getting close to the San Andreas. The San Andreas is still a little bit further east, but this could be picking up some San Andreas activity. It's close enough to do that. Now this is a very turned down site near Carmel, but you can see that there's a lot of tremors. For this to be a turned down site where you see nothing on the baseline on so many of these, uh, these lines, so many of these timelines, um, means that it is well turned down and it used to be a very busy site before they turned it down we've uh, reported from this site earlier on previous programs as we did with north of state street and you can see the small earthquakes through this seismogram there's uh, one two three four five six of them and then we've got tremors uh, up top that are pretty obvious uh, major tremor swarm um, this is north of slates hot springs uh, south of monterey bay 
or continuing south down the coast. Now we're jumping inland to King City, and this is uh, much the same as is done um, about the same amount inland as they would show in the Pacific Northwest, showing the tremor storms. And here, when we get to King City, we see the tremor storms, and they're very significant. And this is like this day after day, every day, um, pretty much at King City. I, there's some variations, but it doesn't drop off very much. And if we continue south to Atascadero, we see very much the same activity, and we're west of the San Andreas again. We're south of Parkfield uh, towards the coast, uh, southwest of Parkfield. So very, very significant activity, daily activity at Atascadero. So lots of subduction tremors down the coast, and these are significant large tremors, and they're larger the further south you get. So that's, um, that's very significant. From uh, King City and Atascadero, we see uh, much greater tremor levels than we do in Central and Northern California. I mean, I guess uh, we're technically still Central California in, in Atascadero, but uh, it's uh, south of Monterey Bay is much more active. Now south of Santa Maria at Sisquoc on the 25th, and this is um, just in the last two days that we've seen this increase. But unfortunately, the seismogram has largely been offline. Most of the day it's been offline. So there's a lot of activity there, but we can't show exactly how much. Los Alamos Co County Park is south of Santa Maria. And look at the tremor levels. This is very much like the PNSN tremors that we see up at uh, the golf course uh, in Washington. Um, and uh, other sites that uh, show a lot of tremors. We've got an underlying small tremor level. We've got occasional um, different types of tremors here. And then we've got this more common tremor level throughout. So there's a lot of activity that's matching what we see in the Pacific Northwest at uh, Los Alamos County Park. And this is the same site on the 21st, just it, at times it gets bigger tremors as well. So I just wanted to show that. South to Camarillo, or Camarillo, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Lighter tremors, and a, but uh, look at the VLF fault shift that we have associated with this. So there's, a, there's an associated fault movement, very, very slow fault movement in this location. Um, and that's going to be, um, that's very near the coast again at Camarillo. You're not that far away, I think about 30 miles inland. So uh, what fault is there? I don't believe it's the San Andreas. Now we're down to the Channel Island Park offshore. So this is uh, just offshore of Oxnard. It's the, uh, the I'm not sure if it's a uh, state park, or I believe it's a state park. It might be a federal park, marine park, but um, offshore, close to Oxnard, we see this. And that's a lot of tremors. That's a tremendous amount of tremors out there. And they pretty much match southern Oxnard as well. They're a little less in southern Oxnard, um, but this is the Levy substation site in southern Oxnard. And you can see there's some VLF movement periods of double waves through here. Don't know why we're getting doublets. Um, through here, but we are getting doublets. There's one here and a second one there. There's two here together. There's two here together. There's two here together. There's two down here together. So I don't know what's, why we're getting the doublets, but overall, we're seeing a lot of tremors, and uh, this begins offshore and comes inland. And this seems to be another perpendicular fault like the Garlock. Now, I talked about looking at Moore Park, which looks much like Chino and uh, Pardee. Um, same signal types, but um, inland of, and following the valley, we get to Moore Park from Oxnard, and we have this activity. And so this is looking like magma-related activity because it's every day. Every day is much the same as this. And the same goes for uh, Oxnard at the Levy site and the Channel Island site. So it looks like we have a perpendicular fault with a magma channel in it. And that points um, to, um, it points inland to the east, movement east to west along a fault.
because that's where the active sites are, related sites. I check sites north and south of these to uh, pinpoint the direction of the activity. Um, moving south and back on the coast, we're, because we're tracking coastal tremors here, we're at Playa del Rey. And Playa del Rey commonly has this um, underlying heavy baseline signal tremor level, but these are additional to what is normal, the larger ones that we see through this area. So we had some associated fault shift. Sorry, I didn't ship blown that up. So associated fault shift, larger tremors, that's what I'm looking at here. Then we go down to Rancho Palos, Palo Verdes, and uh, this is where the Rolling Hills housing development uh, is uh, in this area, which had 12 homes collapse in landslides and another five made un uninhabitable, uh, uninhabitable due to broken service lines caused by ground shifting. And this occurred following the onset of higher tremor levels progressing south following the magnitude 7 south of Ferndale on December 20th, 2022. Higher tremor, tremor levels can contribute to ground instability in sleep slope conditions that already have weak soil structure. Um, so that's just logical. And so we've seen activity that's higher than this um, at Rancho Palo Verdes, but this is kind of an average day of what's going on there. And this has increased uh, over the last, well, since the Ferndale earthquake. This is from Dana Point, which is south of Anaheim and south of uh, Laguna Niguel. I think that's how it's pronounced. And we can see some long period tremors mixed in. Um, but I think this is all tectonic again. I think I believe this is uh, related. This is relatively a significant increase in activity and uh, and pretty new. And we get down to the San Onofre Canyon. Tremor levels have more than tripled uh, in this location. And then we show this uh, small fault shift that's associated as well. So we had a, a more significant fault shift and an increase in tremors. And I'll show you, uh, and this is just in the last couple of days. So two days ago, or two days previous, this is from the 25th. The 23rd is the uh, other site that will, or the other seismogram will show you and you can see the difference so there's there's our baseline that's what we were having before we had some elevated baseline and and uh, very minor elevated baselines and small tremors and it's gone from this over a two-day period to this that's a significant increase just by comparative analysis and then we get down to san diego San Diego on the 25th developed this. And that's a big, big change for San Diego. And that's uh, close enough to the shoreline to be called uh, shoreline tremors related to subduction. And this is San Diego just the day before. And this is a busy day from the day before. This is not, not normally this active at uh, San Diego, but it was already this and went to this. So we're seeing changes even daily at shoreline sites in, uh, in Southern California. And this all has been a progression that we've tracked on multiple programs um, coming south out of south and east after the Ferndale earthquake. So we've been witness to the completion. We've now been witness to the completion of subduction tremor level increases as they spread down the whole coast of California. Not necessarily the amount of the increase, but the distance, the locations affected. We can't go any further south than uh, San Diego um, in tracking California coastal tremors. So the whole coast is now affected. This has progressed since the magnitude 7 earthquake near Petrolia on, the December, on December 20th of 2022. And if the progression of subduction uh, continues, then the tremors along the coast will continue to escalate as the rate of subduction increases. And the associated subduction will produce increasing levels of volatile magma. That lighter and more volatile magma will continue to rise through plate windows and uh, into faults and uh, underneath volcanoes into faults, buttes, fields, cones, and uh, into the volcanoes themselves of Western California. 
strato volcanoes of the Sierra Nevadas, uh, the San Gabriels, and other mountain chains will continue to be involved. They're already involved. Our next program, uh, we're going to show some high risk outcomes. Um, so that was yesterday's program. So I've got these backwards. But I wanted to show you some of the other activity that's going on. Um, because this is also important. And we had this flare-up of activity yesterday north of Mono Lake, and I recorded this from this morning. It was already ongoing yesterday. And that's not going to blow up, but that's they've downsized the activity at the seismograms. Um, they shut down the seismograms for about six days, and they changed, altered a whole bunch of settings. They downsized them. So this was showing as massive activity before, now it's downsized to this. This is major activity still. It was just over amplitude before. At Pine Grove, we had the same thing. This was uh, set lower. And look at the activity at Pine Grove. This is the super volcano we identified. Um, not proven, but uh, it's our theory that this is a super volcano that stretches from Walker Lake uh, in and around Lake Tahoe, associated uh, all the way to Lake Tahoe. 50 mile diameter super volcano that has attachments in act by activity when we get a flare up north of mono we get a flare up at pine grove these two are connected and you can see the valley we showed this on a previous program the valley that uh that uh has all the volcanic features that uh show the connection between these two they're pretty close together and then mono lake connects very closely to uh to the Long Valley Caldera. So I think this is an interconnected system all the way from the Long Valley Caldera through the Pine Grove Super Volcano. And the, that makes that, uh, and, and having long lava tubes between adjacent volcanic structures is not unusual. There's a known one just between Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams. There's a known um, lava tube or magma channel. It's not above the ground, so it's a magma channel between uh, Mount Adams and uh, and Mount St. Helens. So to say that there would not be one between even much, much closer adjacent volcanic um, fields and, and uh, major calderas and um, super volcanoes is, uh, is quite ridiculous to think that there would not be when they're so close together. They run right tight to each other. The Inyo volcanic field is directly connects to the Long Valley Caldera and the Inyo volcanic field then bridges over to Mono Lake. And Mono Lake through the volcanic features and their recent volcanic features with recent lava flows connects right to the super the walk um, the Pine Grove super volcano, 50 miles in diameter. Probably larger than that, but at least 50 miles. So Gardnerville at Southeast Lake Tahoe, this is a big deal as well. This is one of the perimeter sites and it's very active at the same time. And uh, Jones in the Sierra Nevadas, I was talking about the Sierra Nevadas flaring up and here we have Jones at the highest level of activity that we've seen um, in the Sierra Nevadas south southwest of Lake Tahoe. And north of there, which is in the Sierra Nevadas and uh, at Bunker Hill, this site was over amplitude and very, very active. And it's still very, very active. You don't get this level of activity without uh, in, the, in a volcanic location without there being volcanic reactivation involved. So Bunker Hill Butte continues. It's a butte for a reason. Um, and I've gone there on Google Earth and flown through it. Um, and this is an obvious volcanic butte and uh, reactivating uh, this is uh, quite a bit into the Sierra Nevadas, uh, west of central Lake Tahoe. Now, south of Reno near Virginia City, I picked up a couple of very unusual signals. They, they both start on the 3 o'clock line, two different days apart, and they're both about the same duration. So I don't know what's going on here. Maybe there's, I don't see how they would be... Uh, working at this time of the day because this is occurring after uh, after nine o'clock at night. Let's see, 1900 is uh, seven, seven o'clock, sorry. After seven o'clock in the evening. So uh, 1930, 7.30 is the point that we have here. Um, and about two hours of activity. And then the following day, which is today, we have this activity beginning at about the same time, maybe about 10 minutes later. 
and the same degree of activity. So we've got blue, red, and black. Each one is a timeline. Here we've got blue, red, and black. Why are these signals occurring in the Virginia City area um, south of uh, Reno? We don't know, but there they are. So we're just showing it, it to you, and maybe something develops. We become seeing, uh, we end up seeing a pattern. Now, edge come activity is flaring up again as well. So here we see edge come, and there's the magma infill. You look at the size of this signal, you see that there's almost no white showing between these lines. And this is an accurate representation of what's going on. This may be downsized already. This is probably downsized already, but we don't know. But look at what happens on the next seismogram. Here's the same activity we're starting up here. We're looking at this, and then we're looking at this activity that followed. And all of this is supposed to have no white showing between the lines. So it's downsized by about 50, maybe 60%. So they're trying to hide the activity at Edgecombe. They're worried about it. They don't want the public to know about it. They don't want anybody worried about it. It's not, there's not supposed to be reactivation of volcanoes, you know, most of the way up to Alaska on the, uh, in the panhandle. But we've got Wrangell and we've got, uh, which is the Warnofsky Volcanic Island, and we've got Edgecombe reactivating. Now, by geologic standards, Edgecombe is rapidly reactivating, and this is a large volcano, not much smaller than Mount Hood. Um, it, uh, it's actually not much smaller than Mount St. Helens. I, I should correct that. It may take six months or a couple of years to produce an eruption. It all depends on the rate of accelerating reactivation, how much it continues to accelerate in reactivation, if it maintains the same speed or if it gets faster. We don't know just how fast this is going to move. So if it continues to accelerate through reactivation, it may be less than a year. It would be longer than that if it continues at the current rate. Uh, the bigger issue is that this points to subduction occurring about 300 miles north of where the experts say the Cascadia begins at the north end. To the south, Warnofsky Island volcano has reactivated with lava production shown in 2012 imagery, and we've shown a picture or we've shown images of that as, as well. Oops. Yeah. Let's get me out of the way because I can't scroll that up anymore. In 2019, I cap captured imagery of hot spots encircling uh, Sea Axe Cone in BC, east of the north end of the Queen Charlotte Islands, uh, which is now known as Haida Gwaii, renamed. These hot spots were in the snow and caused a miles high steam plume um, from snow melt. And we can see that on uh, satellite imagery. Um, so we know of three reactivating volcanoes north of Vancouver Island. Uh, Mount Edgecombe and Warnofsky Island are each about three quarters the size of Mount St. Helens. And so we have a trend of volcanic reactivation in southeast Alaska that dates back to before 2012. BC has its own active volcanoes, but no seismograms on them. Uh, one such is Fire Mountain upstream of Harrison Lake, and it is a current era volcano with uh, multiple tuyas on the peak. These are fragile, pointy um, structures that do not survive glaciation. So these occurred after the last glaciation, which makes them current era. We don't know exactly when the, um, the eruption was. It's not a recorded history item, but uh, it's since the last glaciation based on geology. So it's got two years on the peak proving post-glaciation activity. And it showed hot spots already back in 2019. Mount Benson, is another one, and it's on Vancouver Island at Nanaimo, and it blew, and it's not a big volcano, it blew off a bunch of steam from three vents on the east flank about three months ago. Esther and I both witnessed this from separate locations. Esther's vantage point was better as she was on a very large ferry coming into Nanaimo, and she could see approximately 10 miles of coastline, and this was the only area of cloud on the east flank of um, the Vancouver Island Mountains, and this was on a clear day. I had a closer view, and the steam was riding, rising vertically quite quickly across an area that was about 400 to 600 feet in width and 800 to 1,000 feet high. And we did a comparative measuring of this um, 
on Google Earth using uh, points of reference, uh, geologic points or, or ground points of reference. And so this steam plume lasted a few hours after we spotted it at the height of activity. So it was already going hard when we saw it and it still lasted for a few, a few hours. So uh, quite unusual um, to see that volume of steam from a, a volcano that nobody believes is, is active, but it certainly is if it's blowing off steam. So there we have it. We've got uh, a much greater area of subduction and reactivation going on um, than most would believe. Subduction is not, according to the experts, supposed to occur in California, yet it certainly is. Um, the seismology and the increase in volcanic reactivation points to it. And we're seeing precursors, and we can establish these reasonably. It's a reasonable theory that uh, there's enough um, in science. You first, you have a, a hypothesis, and, and then you have a theory if you have enough data to support um, your position. And uh, we can move this not into the, the next stage is a law where it's absolutely true. Um, Walker Lane Fault, it took uh, something like uh, 12 years to establish Walker Lane as a fault. All the experts in the field disagreed that it was a fault, even though there was ample evidence that it was. And it wasn't until uh, um, GPS measurements were put on either side of the fault that the uh, scientists had to agree. The uh, stuck-in-the-dirt uh, size <sighs> geology changes one death at a time. It is a common saying in geology. Um, the uh, old guard that has uh, taught a certain um, belief structure for years don't want to give up on what they've learned, and they don't want to accept new ideas. And so this would never be accepted by the experts that California is actually subducting, and not in, um, not in the uh, next few years when it would do any good. So I've got to present the evidence in this way, um, showing all the data so you can decide for yourself, is California seeing subduction as well? And if it is, is it going to be subject to the same processes where the same things are occurring in the Cascadia region? And I think it is. And the other science that we have behind this is the 10,000 years of seafloor core drilling done by uh, Chris Goldfinger and team. And I went over all that data, and that data goes back uh, 10,000 years, as I was saying. And there are clusters, periods when um, you have greater numbers or closer closer periods of um, great Cascadia events. Even though they're about 300 years apart, um, 250, 300 years apart, there are periods when they're closer together and then there's a long space afterwards. Typic and these are called clusters. And there's three um, clear clusters of Cascadia megathrust earthquakes over the last 10,000 years. And we're in the fourth one. We've had five already um, smaller than average Cascadia events in this cluster. And so we're looking at a six, with it, which is unprecedented. Um, but now we're overdue. We're seeing all the activity. And the cluster end earthquakes are normally more than twice as much force as the normal ones because they produce that much more uh, ocean sedimentation disturbance. So we see reactivation um, heading up most of the way to Alaska and there's actually reactivation that goes down in Mexico. And this tells us we, we can track the subduction absolutely down to the south end, down to uh, San Diego now. So this means that uh, we have a greater area that is losing the advantage of friction. Friction is being lost. It's being pushed. Force is overcoming friction, and that's causing the continent to move. And it's moving, including California. It's moving, including north of Vancouver Island. It's moving, uh, it's adding length to the already longest earthquake in the world. The Cascadia was already the longest. And if it moves from 300 miles north of its normal and adds another 300 miles in California, it's going to be just that much more devastating because the longer 
the area affected in subduction, the greater the size of the earthquake. And that's absolute hard science. So uh, we expect as a result that we're going to see precursor activity up to the 8.5 range in California, but those won't be the end. People will say, this is the last, this is the greatest earthquake, this is the one we were waiting for, everything will settle down after this. And then the really big one will hit, uh, you know, months later, um, the biggest one will hit and people will have stayed in unsafe places as a result, um, not wanting to move or not able to move. And, uh, and then they'll be hit um, with a, such, a, such a great devastating earthquake afterwards. So we want to let you know that there is every indication that there's going to be precursors because we have had precursors already. The Ridgecrest was a precursor. The uh, south of Ferndale was a precursor. Um, and so we're seeing precursor events. The Lake Almanor earthquakes were a precursor. So we've got three of them already. And so we expect that there will be more and there will be larger and they will be Basically, those bigger earthquakes are going to be your last chance warnings before the, the great devastating um, mega thrust comes through. And that's why we're doing the science. You're going to have to use your own critical thinking ability to decide whether what I presented is rational and reasonable. Um, or if, uh, if the experts are right. And that's up, up to you to decide, because I can't decide for you. I can only present the evidence and my understanding. And I hope I've been able to do that effectively, and I hope it makes a difference for a bunch of people, because there's a lot of risks involved in this, and they're life-threatening risks. All right? And I care about you guys, and that's why I'm doing this. Uh, somebody's got to be the watchman in this case, and I'm trying to fill that role as I'm led to do it. And all glory to God for what I'm shown. And may you all be blessed by the truth. And uh, this is not a cause for fear. This is a cause for preparation. It's a cause to be mentally and spiritually prepared and physically prepared as you can be for, these, uh, for what's, what's happening. And be prepared to be led by God and ask to be led. Um, You'll have to be uh, spend some time in prayer to find out what the answer is for you, because I certainly can't tell you. And uh, to that small, quiet voice, that yeah. small, still voice, not a big, loud move or get out. It's that small, quiet voice. Absolutely. So listen, like like Esther says, for that still, quiet voice that you hear in prayer that leads you. All right. And uh, may you be blessed by this, and we'll see you next time on Feed My Sheep, Earthquake Reports, and more. Bye for now.